motion and a second on the first interim report. Don't leave anything. <laughs> you want to make a presentation first, Mr. Yes, Richard? Okay, thank you. Just want to, I'll just tell you when to hit the slides, Joe. Good evening, members of the board, Lawrence, the audience. It is time once again for our first interim report uh, where we look at how things have gone for the first four months of the year and project out how things are looking for the remainder of the year uh, since we last met at budget adoption and uh, talk, or, uh, actually the presentation of the uh, unaudited actuals. Uh, there have been a few more changes. Uh, we had a huge election. It's going to make some big changes to some of our numbers you'll see later on in the slides. But before we delve into the 12-13 school year, we're going to take just a moment to reflect back on the closing one more time of 11-12 to kind of set the benchmark of where we start the year off. And every year we do our interim reports, and then we have an estimated actuals when we adopt our budget, and then we finally close the books and we see where we're at. And at this time, we usually go back to reflect on how, how do the projections come out to the reality. And with regard to revenue, things came in very, very close to where we thought they were going to. We were a little bit high uh, overall, about $400,000 than we were projecting in estimated actuals. Uh, revenue limit actually came in low, but local revenue uh, came in and saved the day and balanced us back out. That local revenue was actually the beginning of the CSI credits coming in uh, from pg &E. So that... They started a little bit early because, as you know, the solar uh, was a little bit ahead of schedule. With regard to expenditures, uh, salaries came in a little higher than we were projecting, but benefits were a little bit lower, and that about offset it. Uh, but our big differences uh, were about a 10% savings in books and supplies from what we had projected, about a million point three in or million point two eight in services and other operating expenses. Uh, as well as our contribution to restricted programs actually came in about $2.8 million less than we were projecting. So uh, some good work was being done in uh, transportation and uh, MO and in uh, special education and trying to keep things uh, well contained so we didn't end up having to contribute quite as much as we had originally budgeted. So these were our big changes, our big differences between our estimated actuals and our actuals. Additionally, ending balance is up because of programmatic and site budget carry overs of about $5.6 million. We allow sites to run their full budget during the year, but if they don't fully expend, it carries over into the new year, so the balance goes up, and then that expenditure authority carries over in September when we close the books. But it's been a year where we've needed uh, a higher fund balance than we were initially projecting because the state once again upped the level of deferrals. Our deferred state revenues uh, jumped from 29 million to 37 million last year at the closing of the book. So we had an additional 8 million being deferred. Um, and additionally, we're continuing, we're going to see a screen later about our declining enrollment and about the deficit factor increasing yet again. And to keep up with those, we have to have a higher fund balance because what's happening is cash is going down. And we have to also have a cash balance at the end of the year to be able to cover the payroll as we go into July. And so, although fund balance was looking higher, cash actually was looking higher than we projected. Cash was actually uh, just squeaking by it where it needed to be. But by having that fund balance, it's allowing us to maintain our programs until the state does turn its situation around. And we'll show later how the elections can help that a little bit. Um, for some reason, my titles are cutting off at the top. Um, anyway. What this fully says at the top is in 12.13, no poll of the Proposition 30's passage uh, reverses trigger cuts. This year we were supposed to receive a 3.25% COLA, which would have been $5.2 million that we are not getting because it's being completely deficited out. Uh, the deficit factor is being raised uh, to offset it and make it a net zero year. In our planning for the new year uh, as we go forward into the multi-year projection, you'll see that we're also showing a projection of a net no COLA for next year as well. It's supposed to be a 2% COLA. That's down from where we were at budget adoption when it was projected that next year we'd have a 2.5% COLA. The combination of those two events, the reduction of a half a percent is about $860,000. 
but eliminating it with a deficit factor, tax another 3.4, a combined total of $4.3 million of additional new annual deficit on top of where we were at budget adoption for not this school year, but next school year and the following year compared to where we were at budget adoption. However, with Proposition 30 passing, what doesn't happen in the current year, as uh, Mr. Reynolds pointed out earlier, is that we will not be having the mid-year cuts that were slated to happen if the measure failed. And so, by extension from that, the school year will remain at 180 days this year. We do not have further days. And employees who had, by their bargaining units, elected to have the money start coming out of their checks at the beginning of the year so that we would be evenly spread have already received their refund. But in the meantime, uh, with the trigger cut going away, what we're not getting is, is a COLA, so we're still having to try and cover our rising expenses with uh, relatively flat revenues. It's a slight increase of about $56, but if you'll recall last year, we had about a $55 and change mid-year cut, and so the mid-year cut was a one-time cut, so this puts us back up to where we were two years ago, but basically flat over that two-year period. Meanwhile, the amount we're losing to the deficit factor per student has jumped from $1,336 to $1,492 per student. So we're now at a 22.272% or just over 22 percent cut. That is the equivalent of chopping 40 days off the school year. We're basically being funded to run school for 140 days out of 180. And that would be the equivalent of shutting down on April the 17th or alternatively, uh, chopping the school day down by an hour and 20 minutes of instruction on a daily basis. You remember that number was at about an hour last year, and a little bit under an hour the year before that. So that we're moving gradually further and further up as the deficit factor continues to widen. Going forward, where we are right now, that $1,492 gap, if you count from the right to the third fiscal year back, that's where we are this year. 6701 is what we should be receiving per student. We're actually getting 5208 and 57 cents, so it rounds up to 5209 on here. So that's where we're at with that rather large gap and slated to continue to grow as a gap moving forward because of the projection for no coal the next year. It actually bumps our shortfall per student over $1,627. Meanwhile, the other oh, factor that controls our revenue is our enrollment, and we are still in a declining enrollment model. We lost students uh, from last year to this year. We're currently projecting a decline of 270 ADA. I am hopeful that at P2, I'm going to be coming back to you to tell you that that number is smaller because CBEDS is a little bit better than I was projecting it, but not enough yet for me to be ready to say we can bump the ADA projection. It's still within the margin. So we'll have to kind of wait and see what happens, as well as uh, see where uh, Clayton Valley's P2 comes in because of the way that that works as a subtraction against the revenue limit will also affect this as well. Because in addition to counting as a subtraction, we also lose part of our declining enrollment projection, our protection, uh, based on how many students uh, are into the charters that were district students in the prior year. So here's our enrollment. Uh, from 2004-05 to the present, as you can see, um, we've been on a steady decline. We haven't had a bump up year yet uh, in the past uh, eight years. 0405 was our peak year coming, and then the slide started, and we've been in a slide ever since. The significant year right now, if you look at 1415 and 1516, it's right on that border of 30,000 units of ADA. That is a significant year. As the board members who, who know from our previous presentations, that will be the, the year we cross under that magic number is the year that the reserve goes from 2% to 3%. So we have to increase our required reserve by 50% that year. And right now it looks like it's going to be pushed back one year to 1516. We were originally thinking 1415, but right now it's projecting at about 30,040 for that year. Mr. Richards, you had to point out that the major drop between last year and this year was the Charter. Yes, the major drop there is the charter. Uh, there is a drop related to our actual population as well, but the vast majority of that is, is Clayton Valley uh, spinning off into a charter school and being its own. And even though we report their ADA for the purposes of the revenue limit calculation and then do that subtraction, when it comes to the 2% versus 3% rule, charters are excluded from the calculation. So we that 3% rule will kick in 